Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today, and welcome to the National Adaptation Forum's Heat Stress Series hosted by EcoAdapt. I am Catherine Braddock, an associate scientist at EcoAdapt and your moderator for today's webinar. Our uh, session topic today is heat stress on species and ecosystems. For those of you returning to the series, welcome back. And for those who are just joining us, I would like to go through a few housekeeping rules uh, in order to ensure a successful webinar. So first, uh, to reduce feedback, please place your phone or computer on mute, even if you are using the microphone voice over IP option. Please use the question function on your control panel to submit any questions to the presenters throughout the webinar or to report any technical issues you might be encountering, and my colleague Molly will be able to assist you. We will be recording and posting this webinar on the Climate Adaptation Knowledge Exchange for future viewing, and the webinar will be available online sometime next week and can be viewed at cakex.org. Slides and presenter information, as well as two handouts provided by our presenters are available for download in your handouts tab which is also located in the control panel. Throughout this series, we have been compiling recommended resources on heat stress for attendees, as well as the larger adaptation community. You can make suggestions to this research resource page by following the link in the chat box. We also wanna thank those who have donated to this forum series. If you haven't already, please consider making a donation of $20 to this session or $60 for the series, or paying what you can. Um, if your organization may be interested in sponsoring an upcoming series, please contact us at info at nationaladaptationforum.org. We depend on your support to make sessions like this possible and to keep adaptation moving forward. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge those experiencing immediate threats to their lives and livelihoods due to climate change impacts, recognizing the people who live on the front lines, especially black, brown, and indigenous communities and low-income communities, as well as the species and ecosystems bearing the climate burden, some of which we will discuss here today. Also, while we are here to talk about heat stress, we encourage that you share your work, your experiences, and what brings you to the webinar today via the questions function, as well as on our virtual networking platform. Uh, we also wanna thank you for attending today despite all of the challenges and uncertainties due to the ongoing pandemic. With that, I am pleased to uh, introduce today's panelists. First, we have Amy DeLock, who is a Senior Policy Analyst for Climate Adaptation for the Defenders of Wildlife. Dr. Michael J. Cox, who is a Research Oceanographer with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Tyler Kaspar, who is the Environmental Biologist for the 1854 Treaty Authority. And Dr. Laura Rogers Bennett, who is the Research Associate and Senior Environmental Scientist for the Bodega Marine Lab at the University of California, Davis. You can download more information on our presenters in your handout tab as well. So with that, um, I will pass over our webinar here to Amy to get us started. Thanks for that intro, Catherine, and thanks everyone for being here today. I'm going to jump right in, and if you advance the slide to the next one. Uh, we're going to do a quick summary that might need another click of where we are right now uh, climate wise. So this is NOAA's land and ocean temperature percentiles for the year of 2020. 2020 just barely missed being the hottest year uh, in the 141 year uh, instrument record. It's uh, behind 2016 by about uh, two hundredths of a degree Celsius. So we are sitting right now at about one degree Celsius or 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit above the long-term average. The seven warmest years from 1880 to 2020 have all occurred since 2014, and the 10 warmest have occurred since 2005. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So the idea that increased temperatures due to climate change will have impacts to ecosystems and species is of course not news. This is a graphic from the 2012 National Fish, Wildlife and Plants Climate Adaptation Strategy. It's one of several summary tables of various observed and protected climate impacts. This one specifically on the direct effects of increased temperatures on a number of terrestrial ecosystems as well as freshwater, coastal and marine. Next slide. And in the years since then, we've really refined our understanding of those various temperature uh, heat impacts and at what thresholds they really start to translate into specific ecosystem impacts. So this is a graph from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's lands report that came out in August of 2019. The gray bar that you see across the top is one degree Celsius above the long-term average. That's about where we are right now. And then you see the dotted line 1.5, that's where the IPCC has said we really need to try to remain. Uh, and then two degrees is sort of the fallback uh, target threshold under the, the Paris Climate Agreement and, and the IPCC's, uh, you know, the, 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 they're, they're begging to the world of what we need to keep temperature ranges within. And you can see from this graph why that's the case. So uh, this has a ver variety of uh, parameters, dry land water scarcity, soil erosion, vegetation loss, wildfire damage, permafrost degradation, tropical crop yield decline, food supply instabilities. And you can see here where we're, where we're sitting at one degree Celsius, uh, those impacts are in the yellow or moderate zone for just about all of these, these parameters. And at 1.5, some of them are starting to cross into the red. And by two and beyond two, you get much more into the red for uh, high impacts and the purple for severe impacts. So I'm gonna uh, take, use two of these as a little bit more detailed example. So we'll look at dryland water scarcity and wildfire damage. So next slide, please. So I mentioned that one point, we're at about 1.0 degree Celsius above the long-term average. That of course does not play out equally in all parts of the world. So there are places that are much warmer than that already. And this is a, a nice figure that the Washington Post did just last, uh, last August, uh, showing some of the hot spots in the United States where temperatures are already well above that one degree threshold. So anything that you're seeing showing up in the red and purple colors there are already at two and three degrees Celsius above the long-term average. And that includes a fair bit of the West and Rocky Mountains, as you can see. Next slide. And so this is this was the cover uh, banner of that story. This giant climate hotspot is robbing the West of its water. And it really focused on that area in the Rocky Mountains where both the Rio Grande River and the Colorado River, two of the most important river systems in the Southwestern United States have their uh, headwaters. And those both depend on snowpacks. And with the, the extreme heat that we are seeing, those snowpacks are melting. Uh, and shrinking, melting earlier and shrinking in general. So the average flow of the Colorado River has declined nearly 20% over the past century, about half of which is due to warming temperatures. And that's an estimated 1.5 billion tons of missing water. And there's also a vicious cycle where as a region dries up, it heats up even more and then dries up even faster. Next slide. And then, of course, wildfires uh, have been increasingly problematic in recent years. And this uh, in, uh, screenshot of the interactive fire map uh, from the Forest Service that was from last, uh, I think, the end of uh, August 24th of 2020. And some of those locations of large fires line up really well with some of those hot spots. So you're seeing those places where the temperature is already uh, reaching extremes. Uh, that those areas are more susceptible to wildfire. Next slide, please. And now I wanna to turn to a couple of species examples, and we're gonna look at uh, opposite ends of the temperature uh, threshold here. So this first one is the pica, uh, probably familiar to many of you. Uh, some, sometimes it's called the poster child for climate change. So pikas live in the, the Rocky Mountains uh, and they live particularly live on the, the rock, very rocky talus slopes 
They are active year round, they don't hibernate, and so they rely on a very heavy coat to get them through the winter. And they, they spend the summertime essentially amassing enough food to get them through the winter, uh, and they hide food in, in caches under the, the rocks there. Uh, because of that very heavy coat, they are extremely susceptible to high temperatures, and they have a physiological heat limit threshold of about 95 degrees Fahrenheit, above which they can actually overheat and die. Now, populations of pika have been found to be winking out in some of the hottest and driest parts of the, the Rocky Mountains. Uh, of course, being on, on, um, on mountain slopes, they can only be pushed up so far before they literally run out of space, and it's, it's difficult for them to move across um, the, the down slope and valley habitats to find new, new areas. They don't really do that much. But uh, we are finding that it, all is not lost for the pika. Uh, so some recent research came out about uh, three years ago, three or four years ago, beaver at all 2017 found that they are actually starting to adapt behaviorally, which is good news for the pika. So they are uh, increasing their utilization of forested habitats rather than the open uh, talus slopes. They are uh, making uh, some dietary shifts to year-round food sources such as moss, directly drinking water during hotter and drier months, and increasing their activity at dawn and dusk uh, to to uh, miss out on the heat of the day. So that's one, I think, good takeaway is that, you know, animals do adapt on their own, at least to some extent, behaviorally and evolutionarily. And the, the, the greater extent that we can make sure that habitats remain available maximizes the likelihood that that will happen. Now I want to shift to the opposite end of the temperature spectrum. Uh, this is Agassiz's desert tortoise, obviously uh, adapted to some of the hottest and driest conditions in North America. Uh, but that's a, that in some ways is both a blessing and a curse because they are really existing already at the physiological limit for, uh, for species to exist uh, in those very hot and dry conditions. They do uh, also employ behavioral adaptations, such as burrowing to escape the heat of the day. And they're very, very good at finding scarce water sources. However, because the conditions are so harsh where they live, uh, even a slight worsening of those conditions can uh, be very problematic. So a, a drought in Joshua Tree National Park in 2012 inflicted high levels of mortality on the species, and they are also potentially somewhat limited in how, how long they can uh, engage in some of those behavioral adaptations like burrowing because it can in increase their risk of predation or decrease opportunities for foraging and reproduction. And this trade-off has been seen repeatedly in desert species, including um, desert lizards and desert wood rats. Okay, next slide. So hey, I want to share Molly that. here. Just want yeah. to make you mindful of the time. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, so I want to shift over to a couple of adaptation strategies for heat stress, one of which is protecting refugia, which are the naturally cooler parts of the landscape, north facing slopes, areas with existing snowpack that cools the adjacent air, groundwater fed streams and things like that. So identifying and protecting those uh, is one important uh, heat strategy for species. Next slide. Restoration and providing things like restored shade on, in stream banks is also very important. Uh, forest restoration activities like, uh, that re reduce the risk of uh, out of control wildfires, including control burning, can actually also help with uh, managing heat stress uh, and uh, you know reducing the, the levels of ecosystem damage. And then next slide. And then also increasing connectivity for species that do have the ability to move, it's very important to make sure that we protect the areas along which they can move. This slide here, it's a little bit of a mess looking, but this is uh, some work that Defenders is doing, looking at a number of different models for uh, identified refugia, and as well as identified connectivity. This is looking at areas of model overlap. Uh, and this is part of Defenders uh, 30 by 30, 
uh, recommendations to the administration, uh, and we are hoping that in addition to existing biodiversity and uh, carbon sequestration, that areas that provide refugia and connectivity will be included in 30 by 30 protections. And finally, I just want to draw attention to the new update, sorry, next slide, the new update of the National Fish, Wildlife and Plants Adaptation Strategy just came out a few months ago. Uh, this is that table at the very beginning from 2012. This is the updated version. It does have, I'm not going to read any of the management uh, recommendations that we made. Those are on the next slide, uh, which you can download uh, at your leisure and take a look. And I do, the uh, strategy itself is there in the, uh, the handout section. So that's uh, it for me. Thank you for listening. Great. Thank you, Amy. Um, we will now hear from Tyler Casper. Hi, hi all. Uh, can you scroll to the next slide, please? I'm going to talk a little bit about um, 1854 Treaty Authority, um, and who we are, what we do, uh, talk about our climate change vulnerability assessment and adaptation strategy, and also heat stress on beings such as moose and cold water um, fish beings in the 1854 ceded territory. Next slide. So the 1854 Treaty Authority, we're an intertribal natural resource management organization. We're governed by the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. And you can see is, uh, see a map of what's considered present-day Northeast Minnesota. Um, our charge is to protect and enhance treaty rights and resources um, within this area that you see here, um, and also the off-reservation rights to those resources for those two bands. Uh, so the Boys Fort and Grand Porch bands retained um, rights to hunt, fish, gather off-reservation in this area free of state regulation. And we actually enforced the conservation code um, so we regulate band member activities off reservation in, in this area for those two bands. Um, the Fond du Lac Band Lakes, Superior Chippewa, you can also see on the map here, uh, have retained those same off reservation rights in the area, but they manage their own off reservation rights. Um, but we do collaborate with them on a lot number of projects, including uh, development of a climate change vulnerability assessment and adaptation strategy for the ceded territory and respective reservations each of those bands. Um, this was completed in 2016. There's a link at the bottom of the slide, and I believe there'll also be um, links included um, after the presentation. Um, the plan was, we all thought it was, it was an equal partnership between those three bands and ourselves um, to develop this plan. We felt it was important because we already observed uh, changes and impacts to uh, beings and habitats within this area. And we also understand that once a, uh, a being is lost or habitats are shifted outside of this area um, that's a permanent impact and loss to those bands because the the boundaries you see here for the reservation and ceded territory cannot move and follow those ships those are fixed boundaries um, so it will also help i should mention develop this plan we contracted adaptation national international and uh, great lakes integrated sciences and assessments or GLISA uh, to help develop this plan. There's three main phases. I'm gonna go through quickly in the next few slides, just some brief um, uh, results for climate, especially related to temperature. Um, next slide, please. The uh, first phase is a rapid climate, climate assessment. So what are you seeing here? And this is actually downscale to basically the, just beyond the bound, to and beyond the boundaries of the ceded territory. Um, so you can see the northeast and the central portions. So throughout the ceded territory, temperatures have increased over the time period you see here. Um, annually, three to four degrees. Uh, the biggest changes that we observed um, have been in the winter minimum temperatures. So almost seven degree difference or increase there. Next slide, please. Projected changes out of around 2070 um, with continuing uh, emission scenario. You can see temperature and precipitation here, but again, I'll focus mostly on temperature for um, since we're focusing on heat stress. Um, basically, it's looking like the same for the, up to mid-century. Another increase of three to four degrees um, annually. Biggest increases are expected to be in the wintertime. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So we use this information and also what we know about uh, certain beings and habitats um, in the ceded territory to develop a vulnerability assessment. Uh, we assess vulnerability, um, really considering how vulnerable or sensitive, excuse me, sensitive a species or resource is to the changes in climate. So you can see that in the upper part of the table, the sensitivity. And then you look on the left-hand side, uh, we also consider that being or habitat's ability to adapt. So the adaptive capacity. So how are they gonna be able to adapt to those changes in climate? Um, and you see a kind of a gradient in the upper left-hand corner, uh, beings are in the green. You see black crappie, uh, white-tailed deer, um, low sensitivity and high adaptive capacity. So really are expected to do pretty well with the changes in climate. Um, and as you go down to the lower right-hand corner, you see a gradient of higher sensitivity, uh, lower adaptive capacity. So things are gonna be more vulnerable to changes in climate. I'm gonna talk about a couple of those on the next few slides related to heat stress. Moose, brook trout, you can see there, um, moose is in bold. And just to the left of that, there'll be also cisco, lake trout, and whitefish. Those are the cold water fish species that were covered in this plan. Next slide, please. So heat stress on moose, moose is uh, really in the ceded territory is on the southern end of its uh, uh, current habitat range. Um, they're really a large, they're a large animal. They're well adapted to cooler climates and they can get easily stressed when the temperatures are increased or, or during high periods of hot weather. Uh, so increased temperature not only causes thermal stress in the summer, but also the winter time as well. And again, our biggest increases in temperature have been the winter time. Um, this can lead to more white-tailed deer, which are favored under current climate projections. Um, and we've also observed more deer in moose range. Um, they can be carriers of parasites such as brain worm and liver, liver fluke that do not impact white-tailed deer. So they're benign to those impacts, but once transferred to moose, it can, can be uh, fatal. Um, also, white-tailed deer may bring about more presence of gray wolves um, since they're a preferred prey of gray wolf. And gray wolves are also known to be one of the key contributors to calf mortality for moose in the seeded territory. Uh, warmer winters also, there's less snowpack um, during those warmer winters, and that can increase tick survival. And sometimes moose can have really heavy tick loads, and increases the tick loads increases physiological, physiological stress on those animals. Uh, next slide, please. I won't read through these, but I uh, just wanted to show we do have strategies that were developed. Uh, these are particularly to uh, the thermal stress that we um, impacting moose. Uh, mainly these focus on um, you know, areas of thermal refugia like uh, wetland habitat and cover, um, protecting and enhancing those areas. Also protecting, enhancing foraging habitat, areas of large disturbance or like say wildfires, natural fires actually can produce really good habitat for moose. So trying to find a way to sometimes even mimic that disturbance. Next slide, please. Cobar fisheries, you can see the species are included in this plan. Um, these are in inland lakes, streams, but also in Lake Superior, because um, I don't know if you could tell by the map, but Lake Superior is also bordering the uh, ceded territory to the right where there really wasn't anything showing on the map. Um, but anyways, that's a large, obviously a very large cold water lake. Um, increased water temperatures. Um, all these species are sensitive to water temperature. Anything above upper like 68 degrees to 70 become stressful, even lethal, um, if they experience that for a length of time. Uh, increased water temperatures also can lead to decreased dissolved oxygen. For example, you look at Cisco, yeah, that's a dead one. Uh, but they're very sensitive to changes in, like these other species, changes in dissolved oxygen. And low dissolved oxygen, high temperature can cause sometimes even big die offs um, under certain conditions. Um, reduced ice cover, all the species you see here are fall spawners, spawn in the fall, then um, eggs will hatch in the, in the springtime. So that actually ice cover can protect those eggs from conditions like wind, erosion, sedimentation. Uh, with there's decreased ice cover, there can be decreased protection um, in certain locations. And also in some of the lakes with cold bars, these cold bar species, there's warmer 
air, certain areas that'll have warm water species and habitat. Well, with increased water temperatures, uh, that can become more habitat for warmer water species, which may be more competition or even predation on some of these cold water species. And Lake Superior specifically um, for lake trout and brook trout, there's non-native uh, salmonid species that are stocked there and they've been naturalized, but uh, current, the climate projections may favor some of those species and that may create more actual uh, competition um, into the future. Next slide, please. And again, I won't read through these, but these are some of the adaptation strategies for, I just lumped them together for cold water fisheries as a whole, because there's a lot of overlap, mainly strategies focus on protecting, enhancing um, riparian areas and buffers around along streams and around lakes, um, identifying key areas where there's groundwater sources and protecting those areas, especially along that shore, that the North Shore is how it's, what it's called in Minnesota, and, and that's part of the seeded territory that borders Lake Superior. Um, there's not a lot of groundwater inputs and a lot of the runoff is dominated by landscape runoff. And that also, so in areas where you do have a coal bar source of groundwater, um, that's actually providing uh, thermal refugia for these coal bar species. So it's very important to protect that. Next slide, please. And that's it, so thank you. Thank you, Tyler. And uh, now we will hear from Mike. Thanks, Molly. So I'm going to shift us um, from the land to the sea and talk about marine heat waves, which are um, hot hot events in the ocean. Um, if you go to the next slide, so what is a marine heat wave? Well, you probably have a sort of um, idea of it from knowing what a, a heat wave is um, over land. But it's just a period where the water is much warmer than normal. You know, thinking about it more formally, um, you can look at a, sort of a time series of ocean temperature. Here's an example off the coast of California where the recorded temperature over a few years is in black. Um, and the average uh, temperature for a given time of year is in blue. And then the green line gives this sort of threshold above which we would call that a marine heat wave. So these areas that are in red. Are, are marine heat waves, periods of particularly warm water. Next, please. And so these events happen everywhere, kind of by definition, they happen everywhere. Um, but certain ones really grab a lot of attention because of their, um, maybe their magnitude or their persistence, how long they last or the impacts that they have on the environment. And so this map calls out a few around the globe that have gotten a lot of attention because of the impacts that they've had. And I'm going to focus in on one um, that really peaked in 2015 to 16 in the Northeast Pacific off our West Coast. Um, and just to give a sense of some of the things that can happen that we're thinking about in terms of adaptation. Next, please. So on the left here is an infographic that was put together by NOAA Fisheries, which is who I work for, that kind of describes this event from the physics up through the impacts on the ecosystem and on the, the economics, the fisheries. And so starting with the physics, this sort of walks you through five years. Uh, this is showing temperature at the, on the surface of the ocean, and basically red is warmer than normal. And the reddest parts here are maybe three or four degrees warmer than normal. And so this was really a multi-year event uh, where things really spun up in 2013 um, and persisted through 2016, at least with these really warm conditions before cooling off some in 2017. Next. And if you start to look at the impacts of this event, they're really widespread. And, and you know, temperature is part of it. There are sort of direct temperature influences on marine species. But there's also a lot of influence that happens through the food web where there are changes in prey um, in the productivity in the ocean um, that then filter up through the food web and have uh, various effects, a lot of them negative. Um, so next, I'll just give some examples of what we saw. One of the first indicators that we saw or can see in these events that something is funny is 
um, species showing up where you don't normally see them. So on the left, this is a smooth hammerhead shark. These were spotted thousands of miles north of where they would normally be. So normally they might be as far north as central California and they were found up off Alaska. And there's a whole bunch of species for which this is true. Um, on the right, this is, you know, maybe a positive effect depending on your perspective, but this is a you know, fisher off the Southern California coast with a bluefin tuna that are not normally uh, widely available to be caught there. And in 2015, they were finding them all over the place. Next slide, please. And so moving into 2015 and 16, um, you can go actually again. There was, this was really sort of the heart of this event. Um, and I won't get into all of the impacts. You can read through some of these, but I'll highlight a couple. So one was there were die-offs of some charismatic um, animals, including seabirds and marine mammals like sea lions. So here's an example, example of the common myrrh where there were um, estimated up to a million birds that died in this event. And this com comes back to that food availability, changes in the prey base. Uh, where they just there just was not enough food and all up and down the coast um, there were birds found dead um, and that's what that map is indicating there those circles larger the circle is the more birds found so this is you know in terms of mortality exceeding you know the Exxon Valdez oil spill for those who remember that um, next please and then on the fishery side, we saw, again, a lot of different kinds of impacts, but in some cases, sort of unexpected and indirect impacts. So this is sort of walking through this case study um, where there was a, a combination of things going on. So first at the top, this is showing, um, again, ocean temperature with the normal and the heat wave conditions. And what I wanna bring your attention to is in the normal case, there's this band of purple and blue along the coast. And those are cold waters. They're uh, produced by a process called coastal upwelling, which is where deep water is brought to the surface by the winds. And that deep water is really nutrient rich. It fuels productivity and really supports the food web. Uh, under the heat wave conditions, you can see that those cold um, productive waters are really compressed against the coast. And so what that did was it caused um, whales along the west coast to be much closer to shore than they normally are and in the vicinity of um, a crab fishery that's close to shore with much more interaction there than there normally would be. At the same time there was a outbreak of toxic algae associated with this heat wave and that toxin got into the crab which shut down the fishery for public health concerns. Um, when the Crab fishery was finally opened. It was opened at the peak of the uh, time when whales are in the area feeding. And so that enhanced this overlap of the fishery and whales even more and led to record entanglements um, in 2015 and 2016. Yeah. Next, please. You're welcome. Okay, and then lastly, just again, back to the socioeconomic side, you know, a lot of these impacts, they ultimately lead to economic problems. And these are fisheries disasters that were declared throughout these years. So these fishery disaster declarations open up resources for fishers, but this is just to say that, um, you know, the impacts really do go all the way from the physics up through the, the coastal communities and economies. And then next slide. And then the last point I wanna make is just that um, as I said, this is that was sort of one heat wave. It's not every time a heat wave happens, all those things happen. This was really a quite a remarkable example. But in, in thinking about adaptation and how we make changes to fisheries management, for example, we have to think about these events and the timescales they occur on. So this is um, a projection of surface temperature in that California location again from 1980, you know, 40 years ago out through 2100, the end of the century. And you can see there's this warming trend. If you go to the next slide, when we think about heat waves and define them, we, we typically use these historical conditions. Um, so you've got the average there in black, no change, and then a threshold based on recent history for what constitutes a heat wave. Well, if you go to the next slide, if you just keep that reference point, 
then of course the warming, this warming trend is going to mean that you exceed that threshold more and more as time goes on to the point where by the end of century you might always be above that threshold. Um, next slide, please. But I think it's important in terms of adaptation to rec to uh, realize that it's it's not just that it's not just um, you know the waves are getting bigger or something like that. It's this warming trend, and then if you go again. On top of that, you've still got this variability. So you've got sort of two time scales that you're dealing with of this slow warming and then this variability remaining on top of that. So I think it's important in terms of adaptation to recognize that there are both these slow and fast components and uh, different processes are likely at play. Uh, that's it for me, thank you. Thank you, Mike. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Laura Rogers Bennett. I'd just like to thank everyone at uh, EcoAdapt and uh, thank you for inviting me to this National Adaptation Forum. Next. As Mike pointed out, we have and are having right now, not in the future, massive marine heat waves throughout the world. And I'm gonna focus in on a case study of an example that has taken place within the uh, Eastern part of the Pacific, uh, right where Mike has been talking about the dynamics of the water temperatures themselves. Next. We've seen a tremendous marine heat wave on top of a uh, El Nino event, and this has lasted for three years from 2014 to 2016. We are also seeing major heat waves in 19 and 20. So this is a condition that uh, hasn't been going away anytime soon, and it's had tremendous impacts on our ecosystems in the near shore habitat. Next. We've had persistent warm water conditions and uh, many of these warm waters have been above 12 degrees, which is a nutrient limitation for many of our algal species that uh, form our ecosystems. Next. We can see next that bull kelp itself uh, needs water to be cooler than 12 degrees in order to get the nutrients that they require. Next. Kelps are fast growing. They're growing two feet per day. They're annual organisms and they need abundant nutrients to grow 60 feet in a season. Next. We've also seen that um, cool waters and disease are interacting potentially with sea star wasting syndrome. We've had this species, which is an important sea urchin predator recently listed by the IUCN as critically endangered. And we've lost a number of sea star species. Next. We can see that both Pycnopodia and Pisaster, which are the common ochre stars, have declined in our region uh, during the sea star wasting syndrome. Next. At the same time, we've had an unprecedented massive uh, explosion of purple sea urchins in the region. And that has happened during this absence of stars and warming water. Urchin are very good at resisting starvation. Next. We see these increases at uh, major sites for our recreational abalone fisheries. Next. And we've seen now a perfect storm of bad things for kelps, um, including the sea star wasting disease, wiping out a number of star predators of urchin, the warm water blob and the El Nino. And this spells disaster for our kelp forest ecosystems. Next. This is a photo taken uh, at the same place at the same time of year. And you can see that the bull kelp at the surface is absent in 2016. Next. If we look at aerial surveys, 
The green is the kelp forest off our coasts in Mendocino and Sonoma County, the heart of the kelp forest. We see that there has been a collapse of the kelp forest starting in 2014. We've lost 95% of the kelp forest. Next. If we use uh, Landsat imagery from satellites, we can look at all of Northern California and we see that more than 95% of our bull kelp forests are missing today, uh, as opposed to prior to this marine heat wave. Next. Underwater, we also see the loss of subtitle uh, short kelps and other algal species, and they are now switching into uh, ecosystems that look like sea urchins. So we are at risk of next kelp forest deforestation on a massive scale. Uh, just imagine if the forests on land within one year we lost more than 90% of them. Next. We can see that not only are we losing this ecosystem that provides food and shelter, but we're also seeing a loss of kelp subsidies in deep water. Next. And we're also seeing a loss of the ecosystem services that this uh, kelp forest provides, including fisheries, uh, cultural value for our fisheries, carbon sequestration, as well as the carbon particulate that is so important for our larvae in the nearshore ecosystem. Next. We now have starvation conditions for our herbivores in Northern California that are dominated by crustos, coral, and algae, and no fleshy algae. Next. This has led to a massive uh, die off of red abalone. Here we can see the survivors are shrunken and out of 6,000 abalone examined, we can see next that more than 25% of them are shrunken at key fishery locations. Next. The abalone are uh, also impacted by the changes in our climate in terms of the amount of freshwater flows that we had, massive rains in 2019, and massive storm swells and surges, which both directly killed abalone. Next. This has led to the collapse of our economically important fisheries. The recreational red abalone fishery was closed in 2018. And the commercial red sea urchin fishery, while there are lots of urchin, they're all starving and they needed to file for federal disaster relief. Next. We need to think about climate smart restoration type strategies. We cannot just think about adapt or die. These ecosystems are going to need to have management to help buffer these climate impacts that we are currently experiencing. Next. I'm going to give you some examples of some climate adaptation strategies that we might be able to use. Uh, but here are some rules from Sinner's paper, uh, thinking about how we're need, going to need to, first of all, recognize and respond to these issues, organize partnerships. This is the Kelper partnership that has a, a whole suite of agencies and organizations working within it. We're going to need to act quickly. We're going to need to have the resources to respond to these big changes. We're going to need to develop restoration plans. And these plans and strategies are going to have to be uh, flexible. Next. First, we can think about uh, microclimates and favorable marine microclimates. This is the idea that Tyler talked about, thermal refugia. We know that some places are naturally cooler and have more oxygen than others. There's a lot of variation out there, so we're going to need to uh, capitalize on that. Next. 
We're going to need to take advantage of the life histories of some of these species. Thinking about kelps, there are potential for spore banks and there is uh, mechanisms for transplanting and growing kelps. Next. Next. We're going to want to create areas where we control urchins so that kelp can regrow. Uh, we're going to need to develop recovery plans for kelp. And the Greater Farallons Association with Fish and Wildlife has developed a plan and there's an Ocean Protection Council interim action plan for kelp on their website that they are looking for feedback on. Next. Next. We're going to think about what can we do with starving urchins. There's a creative solution where if you go back one slide, we are thinking about the ranching of sea urchins so that they can uh, be fed and we can produce a sustainable seafood product. This can help to restore the ecosystem and uh, in trials at the Bodega Marine Lab and San Diego State University, these uh, feeding trials have been very successful. Next. Next. So uh, if we go back one slide, uh, we need to think about what's going to be happening. Sorry. We're going to need to think about what's happening with uh, red abalone and we're going to need to help to restore red abalone. Back one slide. And some of the features of that restoration of abalone are going to include translocation of adults, keeping track of disease, feeding survivors and restoring kelp. So that's going to be a key feature for helping these species overcome and survive this uh, climate disaster. Next slide, please. And we're going to need to keep track of what's going on with our resources and our restoration programs. We're going to need to monitor and assess whether our restoration strategies are working. If they're not working, we're going to need to adapt them and change them uh, until they do. Next. So we are experiencing massive kelp deforestation and a loss of a critical ecosystem for our communities in Northern California that depend on abalone fishing for their economics and urchin fishing for their uh, well-being. We're going to have to think of ways to uh, increase kelp and protect kelp. And we're going to have to enact these active restoration strategies to help this ecosystem overcome this huge catastrophe. And with that, I would like to thank everyone. Next slide, please. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Laura. Um, I would like to welcome back all of our presenters um, to turn their webcams on. We will go ahead and move into our Q&A portion of the session today. Um, I know we're about 10 minutes to the hour, so I would just like to remind all of our attendees that this presentation is being recorded and will be available um, on cakex.org. Sometimes next week, if we do happen um, to go over time, you will be able to access the, the webinar there. Um, so thank you again to all of our presenters, and um, as a quick reminder, if uh, anyone has any questions, please use the question function to submit those. Um, I will start with a question for all of our presenters um, that was submitted by an attendee. Uh, could, how 
can we promote adaptation actions that reduce heat stress for people and natural communities slash wildlife at the same time? And if possible, could you provide an example of what those actions might be? I think tree planting is one that, that provides both shade in urban areas as well as, you know, can provide habitat and food resources depending on the species chosen. Um, so, uh, and I, unfortunately, I missed the urban heat session, so maybe you guys talked about this already, but there's a, a group called the Chicago Wilderness Project that is combating uh, heat stress uh, for people as well as trying to restore and reconnect habitats in the Chicago area. And one of the things that they're doing is choosing um, species that are that are native species, but they're choosing cultivars from further south. So they might pick, say, a red maple that came from southern Illinois rather than one that came from Wisconsin. So that they are looking at the you know potential genetic variation within species and choosing species that or choosing um, you know populations and cultivars that might have a better chance of surviving in uh, increasingly warm conditions. And then those, again, will both battle the urban heat island effect and potentially provide some habitat as well. Great, thank you, Amy. Um, we also have a question submitted for Tyler. Um, are there co-management efforts with the state and how are you able to get the downscaled climate data? Oh, okay, uh, yeah. For sure, uh, there's a lot of collaboration with the work we do. Because um, we're, we're actually in that whole area that I showed in the city territory, we're a co-manager there. We don't own or manage land ourselves, um, but support of the bands we serve. Um, we're working with, um, on state lands, it's usually like Department of Natural Resources um, from Minnesota, and uh, federal lands like the, U the U.S. Forest Service, there's a large chunk of the Superior National Forest that's in the 1854 seeded territory. Um, so a lot of the work that we do on the ground, a lot of that is in collaboration with the, the other management entities. Um, the downscale climate modeling actually came through um, when we developed our plan, uh, Great Lakes Integrated Sciences and Assessments. So GLISA um, was part of that project and they did the climate assessment. Um, they used NOAA's uh, two of NOAA's climate subdivisions in Minnesota, the Minnesota Northeast and East Central, um, which most of the seeded territory is part of the Northeast, but the Southern portion, um, a, a chunk of that was actually in the, the East Central. Uh, so I use that information to do the, the downscale, downscale climate modeling for our project. And I, we, we're just in talks now actually to start updating our plan, revisit things, because it's almost been five years. And you know, some of what I showed you might have been a little dated. I, I don't think things have really changed, but uh, we're going to start looking back at that. Great. Thank you, Tyler. Um, we have another question. What do you think are some of the top strategies that can be taken to help species in aquatic and riparian areas adapt to climate change? Uh, I can start on that one. Um, I, I think, I guess, in terms of just reducing heat stress, uh, reduced emissions is an obvious one, right? Like anything we can do to slow warming trends is a big one. Um, but then on the uh, oceanic side, I think of like allowing them to adapt to the degree they can without additional stressors. So this is a lot of what we're thinking about in terms of um, altering uh, fisheries management strategies is if species are shifting their distribution, for example, they're heading north um, to escape warming waters, um, they can run into new threats because they don't have the same protections or maybe they're interacting with a fishery that they didn't before. So this is the kind of thing where, um, you know, being able to incorporate climate information into fisheries management strategies so that you can alter fisheries closures or or things like that is a way to facilitate adaptation. 
And yeah, I alluded to some of those um, kinds of strategies in my talk, like restoring shade, restoring riparian vegetation can help with cooling water temperatures, doing things like fencing out cattle and providing all alternative water sources for livestock can reduce some of the trampling, can keep vegetation intact, reduce sedimentation, uh, and then as well as, you know, identifying and protecting areas like uh, springs and, and groundwater areas that groundwater tends to remain relatively cool, even if the air temperature is higher. So, you know, maintaining those cool sources, even things like restoring beaver where it previously had been because beaver build dams create a pond and then that pond tends can, can um, you know, filter and, and halt sedimentation and can you can get some cooler water from the beaver dam and also restoring stream structure, riffle and pool structure, uh, coarse woody debris, all of those things that, that uh, can provide, you know, shelter area for riparian species aquatic species. Thank you. Um, we have a question for Laura. On land, urban forests provide crucial cooling and shelter for people. Would you say kelp forests do the same for underwater populations like sea stars? Yes, the, the kelp plays a critical role in structuring the entire kelp forest ecosystem. So much like trees on land, they're providing the food and shelter for a whole suite of organisms. Um, I, I gave some examples of some of the ecosystem services that they provide in terms of uh, carbon sequestration, uh, buffering shorelines, and also providing food subsidies to, to the larval community and the plankton as well as the deeper water communities. So those uh, kelp blades will be washing down into the deeper ocean and provide food subsidies both there and up on the sandy beaches as, as rack, as beach rack, which is feeding the, uh, the small insects on the land and, and some of the birds who depend on that. So it, its loss is going to be felt uh, throughout uh, multiple regions, uh, not only that nearshore strip, but also other parts of the ocean and, and the land. Okay, thank you. Um, we had a question for Amy. You mentioned that pikas are moving to forests. Can you talk about a few other animals that are moving to um, shady refugia? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that I can think of any offhand. Certainly species range shifts um, have been, you know, found, uh, you know, a number of species are shifting their ranges. Uh, it depends, you know, a lot on what the connectivity is, uh, whether there are habitats available, whether there are uh, areas, you know, that, that, that are uncrossable, uh, either due to their, their climatic insuitability or, uh, you know, to things like development blocking the way. Um, pika is the only one that I can think of that's been documented in the literature that's specifically using shaded areas more, but I, there are almost certainly other species. Uh, I just, mm -hmm. sorry, I can't think of them right now. Thank you. Um, what are action items a small business or individual landowners can take to mitigate heat stress on local species and ecosystems? I can uh, answer some of that. We have in our region in Northern California, a number of small businesses that have come together uh, to promote and work with recreational as well as commercial sea urchin divers. And they have come together to remove sea urchins in discrete uh, areas where we can uh, try and bring back small patches of kelp forest. So those small businesses, including campgrounds, um, dive shops, recreational diver groups, um, they have all really come together and been a big part of the solution in our region 
They're also uh, starting to band together in central and southern California, where uh, the sea urchin population spread has been uh, happening, and we're starting to see the loss of kelp forests in the Monterey area, which support uh, sea otters, which need those kelps in order to survive the winter. I'd add, um, you know, landowners can look at whether they're eligible for uh, Farm Bill conservation funding to do habitat restoration and protection. Uh, you can also try to partner with local land trusts, uh, which do a lot of conservation. They can, you know, do easements, land purchases, um, you know, certain development rights purchases. And then if you're, you know, a more urban business as opposed to a landowner, uh, I would check to see whether your city or county has an adaptation plan and see if there are uh, actions within that that businesses are recommended to take. Great, thank you. Um, I know we are coming up on the hour here. So uh, before we end our session today, I would just like to ask our presenters if they have any final uh, thoughts they'd like to share for our audience today. I unfortunately do have to jump to another meeting, but thank you very much again for having me. Bye. Thank you, Amy. I, I would um, just say you know, it was it's exciting to have the ocean be part of this. I'll advocate for that, and it's nice to have attention on. I know um, probably a warmer ocean is would be a welcome thing for a lot of people, especially up our coast and the way we use it recreationally. But um, this increased understanding of of what heat stress means for the ocean and and um, for seafood production and things like that that we also rely on on land is great to see. I'd just like to echo uh, Mike's words in terms of thinking about heat stress in marine systems and how that's going to be shaping the distribution of these species and how our management's going to really need to think about uh, where these species are going to be seeking refuge um, and how we can work together to try and bring the resources uh, like we have for land issues to the ocean because we're going to need these in the nearshore environment. We're going to need land trusts, that we're going to need ocean trusts, we're going to need all those kinds of same things that uh, that our panelists have been talking about. I guess for me, I guess it's, uh, I think it's just important to point out, especially for our work, for any work with climate change, how important partnerships are. And um, like for us, I mean, we've shared any of the work we've done with multiple partners and um, trying to collaborate in projects is, is really key to getting things done. Um, and right now we're actually uh, in a lot of several different meetings with the U.S. Forest Service for Superior National Forest and how they consider um, uh, you know, considering assisted migration of certain tree species given the projections and what we're currently seeing for certain tree species. And um, we just appreciate their efforts for getting tribal perspectives on this. and. Um, trying to get all points of view and how they consider um, planning going forward. So I, I just want to point that out, that it's important to involve as many partners as you can and uh, really think about who would be interested or would be good to get perspectives from. Thank you. Um, again, thank you to all of our presenters for your great presentations today. And thank you for all of our attendees for joining the Heat Stress Series. Uh, again, we will be sending out a recording of this presentation early next week. And so feel free to point out um, to any colleagues who weren't able to attend today the broadcast. It will be posted again at the Climate Adaptation Knowledge Exchange, accessible at cakex.org. Um, in addition to this, uh, webinar series. CAKE is home to hundreds of different types of adaptation resources from toolkits to case studies, um, including resources related to today's presentations.
uh, after today's session, you are invited to um, join our virtual discussion via our online networks and uh, look out for announcements for future virtual adaptation um, forum series. We look forward to hearing uh, about your webinar experience in our post-webinar survey response. And finally, on behalf of EcoAdapt, uh, thank all of you for joining us today and taking the time to tune in to our webinar. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. Thank you.